So I'm Jeff Horowitz. Um, I head up the, the real estate team at B of A Securities. Um, it's my pleasure to speak to you all today and introduce these great panelists to talk about something that's particularly topical. It is getting ahead of the digital market. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend um, a few minutes introducing our panelists. Then I'm going to give a little context. We're going to take you back in time, and then we're going to take you forward. And so hopefully um, you all enjoy it. And if you've got some questions, we're going to leave some time at the end to, uh, to go through them. So we've got three wonderful panelists. And I'm going to go in alphabetical order. We've got Kristen Gannon. Kristen is a friend for a long time, has spent 25 years as a banker, worked on many, many transactions. Um, she's with Eastill Secured. Um, she's on their management committee based in San Francisco. But interestingly, she also has been on a number of boards um, of different companies. And so I think that's going to be very topical today. She's been on TriPoint's board. Uh, lineage, Logistics, James Campbell, and, uh, and so she can give some insight from that perspective. Uh, Tom Greer is a managing director, good friend as well, and he runs the real estate team at J.P. Morgan. He's been doing this also for 30 years, and he's going to give us a little bit of a sense of the transformation of what's happening. He's worked on all kinds of M&A deals, etc., super involved uh, in the industry. And lastly, Brendan Wallace. Uh, Brendan, this is like the topic that's perfectly made for him. Uh, Brendan is a co-founder and managing partner of Fifth Wall, where he guides the firm's strategic vision. Uh, Fifth Wall, for those of you who don't know, it is the largest asset manager focused on improving, future-proofing, and decarbonizing the built world. Um, he's been an entrepreneur, been a banker, been a lot of things. And so um, I think he'll have some really fun insights for you. And so to give some context here, as I was thinking about this panel, you know, I said it's kind of interesting, and we had this dinner last night um, where a number of the speakers were, how we've seen our business transform over time. You know, this is a business that used to be a handful of sectors, but it's really changed. And, and when you think about this topic, you have to approach it, I think, from a couple of perspectives. One is the REIT model um, has evolved and actually includes a number of true tech-oriented companies. That's their primary business. But as this whole topic of digital nature, technology, et cetera, has evolved and is moving more and more quickly, it's really impacting every company. And uh, it's, it's a moment where, when I think about real estate, you have to sit there and say, real estate, just because of its physical nature and location, is going to be a very, very important part of some very big topics, whether it's climate change, sustainability, you know, we can talk about EV, AI, all sorts of things. And so it could take us in a lot of different directions. And so I want to start off um, by talking to Tom. And Tom, as, as you think back and you, you look at our industry over some period, um, just give people a sense of context of what you know, our business looked like, what it looks like today, because some of our biggest companies right now really are really smack in this space. So yeah. why don't we start so, out there? So when I started, um, well, first I want to thank uh, Robin and Adam, and it's uh, great to be in front of so many NYU students, and at J.P. Morgan we're always happy to, to, to speak with the students and interact with you, so it's a pleasure to be here. And, and so Send thank your resumes you. over here, I just heard that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but, um, <laughs> Th thanks, Jim. So when I started 30 years ago, we were talking about four property groups, essentially, retail, multifamily, industrial, office. And I, I really do believe that the real estate sector is quite, quite innovative. And we'll see what, if, if Brendan agrees with me. But I do believe it's quite innovative. And we've seen other sectors emerge. And the sector, I think, including like single family rental, which really emerged after the great financial crisis or during the great financial crisis, in large part due to the securitization efforts of our firms and some of the things that some of the private equity groups did as well. Um, a sector that I, I think we're spent to, it's, it's intended to spend a little bit more time around is really what's happening on the technology side. And you know, the, the, the digital infrastructure REITs have grown exponentially with global digitalization. And, as, and that's in conjunction with cloud, cloud services, um, edge computing, automation, AI, which we'll, I'm sure we'll hear a lot about today. But just in terms of scale of what's going on from a, from a cloud perspective, in 2020, cloud services has represented about $300 billion of, of revenue. By 2027, that's going to be over a trillion dollars. That's a 20% compounded annual growth rate. The key drivers, of, of course, are corporate and government initiatives around data centers and data center investment, hyperscalers like Amazon, Meta, um, Google, et cetera, and then, of course, the growth of AI, which, which requires even more super compu uh, computer power. Um, so then I think this, this trend will continue with respect to what's happening in digital. 
Um, given this, this growth, it's no surprise that five of the largest, uh, five of the 10 largest REITs are digital infrastructure REITs. 10 years ago, the market cap of that group was $85 billion. Today, the, those five companies or the digital infrastructure REITs represent about almost $300 billion of market cap. That's, I don't think that's surprising. If you think about from an earnings standpoint, the digital infrastructure REITs have grown earnings over the last 10 years at about 12% compounded rate. That's significantly higher than a traditional property REIT over the last 10, over the last 10 years. I think the outlook for the digital infrastructure REITs is quite positive. I think it's quite positive for a number of the other sectors as well. Um, I think the, the expected demand for digital is gonna continue to rise. Last year alone, we had record gigabyte uh, leasing in the data center space. I expect that to continue. And in terms of long-term growth capacity in the sector, it's gonna increase nearly twofold over the next 10 years. Um, there are challenges, land, power constraints, um, the supply chain, labor shortages as it relates to development. But I think when you look at what's happening, and I think you're seeing it in your daily lives with respect to what's happening with the cloud, it's gonna be quite positive for the digital infrastructure REITs. Yeah, and I think, Tom, what's kind of interesting to me is that when you look at those companies, um, you know, there's not that many REITs that are truly global companies. I mean, there's a handful, and, and, and there's different reasons for that. The real question is economies of scales and efficiencies. And I think when we start talking about these companies, these are legit, big time global companies who finance all over the market, all over the world, and really do so efficiently. And so, you know, the question a lot of people will often ask is, is will these be the survivors? Will it be another type of, you know, company that comes along? A little hard to know, I think, at this point. But clearly some of the real leaders in the space, I think you'd agree, are probably um, in, this, in this little world here. There's no question. I mean, if you look at American Tower, for example, it's gone from $30 billion of equity market value to close to $100 billion. Digital Realty, since two, over the last 10 years, has gone from close to $10 billion to close to $70 billion today. It's hard for me to imagine that these companies don't continue to consolidate bolt-on acquisitions on a global basis and access capital quite aggressively. Yeah, and, and I think that you'll, you'll, you'll probably say, and you know, um, Brenda, you may have something to say about this or Kristen, but, but some of the more traditional companies, um, Prologis, big solar business, right? A lot of rooftops, a lot of single family homes. So I think that you're gonna start to see these plays, these companies really evolve with the market as well. Yeah, um, I would say, um, you know, in the last several years, most boards have, um, you know, talked to their management teams about putting ESG plans in place. You know, at the beginning, it was more the social and governance and diversity on the board, but it's become much more focused on the E part of ESG um, and, you know, environmental efficiency. So good example, um, you know, a prologist that they were putting solar, now they have very specific um, goals as part of their ESG plans of reducing their carbon footprint, but I think by, I, I believe, 50% by 2030 by putting solar on all their roofs. Um, Hudson Pacific, an office company, um, has very specific you know, plans as to how they're, um, what they're doing in terms of um, renewable energy, um, you know, in all their buildings, energy storage. Um, they also have a, a goal, they have to meet the goals in California, because California is actually one state where you, um, every company has to reduce their carbon footprint by 2030, and I think New York City, it's 2050. Um, but, um, you know, have very specific goals and have told investors and the market as to what some of those initiatives are and, you know, goals to meet. Yeah. Um, I'd say it's even more um, prevalent in Europe, um, especially on the asset side, um, where the Eurozone and UK have really forced regulations and a lot more quickly than we're seeing in the US. Um, you know, I, I already I think by 2021 in the 19, is it 19 countries in Eurozone, I believe, um, they had to be um, reduce overall um, energy or be a net zero energy, not net zero carbon footprint yet, but net zero um, energy in, in the UK. Um, you know, when we're selling assets, I would say ESG is the most important thing um, because um, because of the regulation they're actually ranking buildings so in the eurozone you're ranked every building a to g a is you know you're clean and um, g you're not and you have to spend a lot of money to make it um, you know qualified and they're not going to be it's not just that they're getting fined they're not going to be allowed to operate the building or lease the buildings and so it's very hard to sell a building if you're not going to be able to which, uh, which I think if, if, we, if we think about you know Europe being a little bit of a leading indicator for here we're not going to less 
right? We're going to more, we're going to more right. efficient. And I think when we start hitting on this topic, and again, you've worn a few different hats of, I'll call it board member, asset sale, regular way boardroom in, in a way that Tom and I are, um, capital is going to be really important. You're going to need to have yeah. capital to be able to do this, which is an issue today as a lot of companies aren't trading so well, yeah. right? They're going to have to make trade-offs. You know, how do companies think about risk in that market, in, in that context? You know, hey, I won't have enough money, or hey, this is going to be obsolete. How do they start right. to think about some of those well, things? Well, I mean, and I think we heard it last night, some of the multifamily um, REIT leaders saying, you know, they're not going to spend the money unless they see it as a benefit to their NOI, right? Well, mm -hmm. But there's other sectors like office where you have to spend the money, otherwise you're going to be, you know, fined or you're not going to be able to, um, you know, to, to attract tenants. Tenants are very focused on how sustainable is the building and, you know, what, what, uh, what's their energy usage. So it's going to be forced. Um, I would say in raising capital and investors looking at what the risks might be, um, you know, there's a company you mentioned, I was on the board of Lineage Logistics. It's a private company, but it's the largest cold storage company. And there has been a lot of focus from um, investors on, um, you know, where the risks are. It's a, it's a heavy operating business, not just lease an, an industrial building. They operate it. So um, all of the initiatives they have on the energy side, they've had to prove to investors that it's money making. Making, right, because it's a way to reduce expenses and, and, and thus more of the rent being paid um, by the tenants is going to the bottom line. So they've done all, they are not just doing solar, they're doing these uh, thermal AI where they, you mm -hmm. know, figure out the exact right time to use certain energy sources. Um, they have programs of um, logistics on the trucking side so that a truck comes to the cold storage facility at exactly five minutes, you know, to the time that they have, they have a whole GPS thing that the, if the guy's in traffic, if the truck's in traffic and it's going to be delayed, they put another truck there. So all of these things that are, you know, revenue generators versus right. just, um, you know, uh, energy. Well, it, it feels like, look, we're, we're about to hit on some topics and I'm sure we'll get into this a little later, but whether it's through real data analytics, um, revenue enhancements, revenue streams that we might not have had, you know, so far, these are all things that are going to start to come in play given the physical nature of the assets. And I think it probably means that the more sophisticated, bigger companies who have some more money and more infrastructure probably have an advantage. I mean, if you think about, you know, if you live in the house or anywhere and you turn the light switch on and off, well, now all of a sudden you have a smart system, you need someone who actually really knows something, right? And so it's, it's all those things to get that efficiency, you actually have to have something. Yeah, it's going to so, be hard for owners of Class B and Class C office, right? That it's right. already a stressed sector. Are they going to spend the money? I mean, they aren't even spending money on TIs for their tenants. So yeah. obviously there's going to be a lot of facilities that, you know, don't have the capital to do it. And, yeah. you know, they're going to see more diminution in, uh, in value than they've already seen. Yeah. So, so let, let me turn to Brendan. And I think that, um, you know, Brendan has a, an awful lot to say on this topic. Um, and it's a very broad topic. So we'll try to figure out how to break it down in a few different ways. You obviously saw this a number of years ago from a trend perspective to start Fifth Wall, right? And when you started the company, um, two things of interest to me, one is that there really wasn't anybody like that. Um, and two, how you started to get your initial sponsors, so to speak, the players in the sector, I thought were particularly interesting because it can help drive a lot of different things. So why don't you just take us back a handful of years and then we're gonna start to go forward. Yeah, well, thank you for having me, NYU. Um, I imagine I'm probably, I don't know if I'm the first tech person to ever be on stage here, but I doubt I'll be the last. Um, you have three bankers and Brendan. Yeah. <laughs> um, Ex-banker. Yeah, I was actually saying this last night. You know, when we first had the thesis for Fifth Wall, our theory was real estate, the largest industry in the U.S., 13% of U.S. GDP, the largest asset class, the largest lending category, didn't have any venture capital funds focused on it and had kind of this small cottage industry of in investors in it and there was no institutional capital. So, you know, me and Brad had the idea to start the first, but then we went out and we pitched large institutional real estate owners, many of whom are in this room. And I I'm guessing we got maybe like 200 no's and seven yeses. And what it felt like back then is that we had to create demand for tech. We actually had to explain, oh, tech is existential to what you do. I know you didn't have to do tech, but now it's 2016, 2017, you have to do tech. Well, I think the basic premise was if I have a good location, they will come. Yeah, and, the I, most part. And, and to the first question you actually asked Tom, I would say 
there was a growing awareness that the line between what a tech company is and a real estate company is was getting blurry. Like most of those companies you just referenced, data center businesses and tower companies, back in the day, those were tech companies. Those weren't real estate companies. No one conceptualized them as real estate companies. So the first iteration that I think like got the real estate industry thinking was that, oh wait, these new sectors that seem like tech, they actually look and feel and have cash flow characteristics like real estate, maybe they're real estate. That was the first thing. The second thing were the companies, and you referenced it as well, where tech was actually existential to their existence. Take invitation homes. You can't take multifamily, flip it on its side, throw it across a whole bunch of cities, and manage them without tech. That is a okay. tech problem. So tech was literally the connective tissue that made that business work. And so that was the second thing that I think got the real estate industry thinking. And now, I think where we've evolved to is a place where the real estate industry is fundamentally reimagining what it does. So you brought, up, you brought up the example of Prologis and solar. I mean, the real estate industry is at the most essential level, like how do we use space to make the economy? And how do we use space, I think, efficiently? Efficiently, exactly. Right. But the way we use space is changing. Now we do computing inside space. We use right. it for cell towers. We use it, obviously, for office and multifamily and all that. But there's all these new asset classes that are colliding with it. Vertical farming, co-living, co-working, short-term rental, all these spaces that seem today like, oh, those are tech, those very well might be real estate in five to 10 years. Right. And one of the largest REITs might be an indoor vertical farming REIT. So I think what started to happen and what the real estate industry has internalized is that the line between what is a tech company and what is a real estate company is getting kind of opaque right now. Well, you know, it's interesting because we talked about this a little bit last night, I thought also, you know, companies in real estate, when they, when they first came public, everyone wanted them to be in their lane, right? You are a whatever company, apartment company, a retail company, et cetera. And I think we're learning that people don't really work that way and live that way. And so the companies are evolving and they're, started, they're still in a bucket in part because the research analysts there and people always said, you know, you have to, um, I'll do my own diversification for myself. But it's just not the reality of the way the world's working. So the technologies, I think, are crossing them. The need for data is crossing them. And hence, I think your investors are looking to some of those things too. And it's, it's colliding certain industries. Right. So today, everyone in the room who's in the real estate industry does, probably doesn't know it yet, but you're in the gas station industry. You're in the gas station industry because every EV is gonna be charging at a real estate asset. So the entire gas station industry, close to a trillion dollar industry, is going to become the real estate industry. And what that means is the real estate industry is going to be, have to become a utility industry, a very small scale, very miniaturized, very distributed one. But what's so interesting about that is that when you talk about you know, tech and the way tech is impacting real estate, a lot of the conversation can have a negative tone to it. Oh, there's all this CapEx and retrofitting and ESG, and that is true. But I think sometimes the opportunistic revenue generative ways that the real estate industry can adopt tech, oh. looking no further than EVs, Huge. sometimes get missed in that conversation. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. I think that, um, and I think, Tom, you'd probably say this too, when the whole SPAC boom started, um, it was one of the first times, you know, our group tended to stay in its, its lane. You know, we did interact a little bit with our financial institution group or a little bit here and there, data centers, whatever it is, but all of a sudden, every sector, it could be, you know, energy prop tech or fig prop tech, all of a sudden we were, lines were crossing. It was the first time that I really saw that in a way, which was hard, because all of a sudden people had to work together differently. And I think you see this, I'm sure you saw this at JP Morgan, I'm sure you see it again in your day job of how do these things work and you know, whether it's the gas station example or whatever it might be. Yeah, there's no question. I mean, there's companies in, in your portfolio like Smart Rent, which is um, significantly across the real estate space, but that's a company that we spent more and more time time with, kind of during that time period of the last couple of years, figuring out capital alternatives for an innovative technology company that's highly correlated to our real estate efforts. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I think you also saw is that it's a little bit more boom and bust, because when you look at, and, and you're used to this in the venture capital world, not every company is gonna ultimately be successful. The theme may be successful, and there may be, I don't know what the right number is, two out of 10, three out of 10 really work, but they're not all, you know, if you are the multifamily person in you know, New York or New Jersey or whatever, it can all work. Here, somebody may leapfrog you, right? So you have to sift through that from an investor perspective, and I assume you're having conversations with so many REITs who are partners um, as well on this topic. 
Yeah, I think the real estate industry is an industry where operational intensity, the business of being a real estate owner or being a REIT is going up. There's more operational intensity. And to some extent, it seems like public market investors are rewarding that. If you look at some of the most valuable REITs today, a lot of them have a lot of operational intensity. Yeah. Yeah. And when you look for a secular tailwind for technology, it's where operational intensity is going up because tech can help you do things more efficiently, right? With less friction, with lower cost. And so I think every asset class is now looking at tech, not just defensively, but opportunistically. And that is the biggest change from when we started back in 2016. Back in 2016, it was do tech because we're scared of the tech <laughs> boogeyman. Now it's how do we adopt tech to dramatically change our business and give ourselves a competitive advantage over our peers around operations or around spotting asset classes that no one else is going to see until it's too late. Well, I think this is one of the issues that, um, that I remember talking about with, with a number of folks who have scale. They said, well, you know this is going to be a big topic. Who in your organization actually knows enough about it to do it? Like, how do you, who, who understands this? And most real estate companies were headed by an entrepreneur, they were a developer, you know, they bought and sold things, whatever. It doesn't mean they're an expert on these topics. And so it means that in the boardroom you need some different expertise or you have to grow it or something. And, and that's been always, I think, a funny issue, which um, probably a lot of companies outside of our world also face. But, um, and I think probably the folks at NYU would say, too, from an educational perspective, you know, only so many professors <laughs> know about certain things. How do you stay current? Because we're moving faster, we're not moving slower. And so what kind of um, impediments did you bump into as you try to educate companies on this, um, about technology, why they should adapt a smart rent versus latch versus whatever. How do you, how do, you do that, practically speaking? Well, just l let me add another statistic. Ten years ago, it was hard to find a CTO among our client base. Today, so I think this conversation is a little bit easier today. Today, at least 50% of our clients, and I know that's growing, you'll probably have a better perspective on this, have a CTO. So you can, and it's part of the conversation that we're having with our clients, you can have a technology conversation with many of our clients, certainly the larger scale clients where they can invest in that type of infrastructure, but we're having that conversation more and more today than we ever had. Well, well I remember actually being on this stage and um, I can't remember what the panel topic was, and I said to the, the four CEOs, I said, so who is the person that's gonna be your successor? What's gonna be their background? Is it gonna be somebody that came up like you? Like, who is it? And I, that wasn't on my question list for people. They probably weren't too thrilled about it. So really no one knew what to do except laugh. But, but I think it's a legitimate question now that has to be thought about differently because of where the potential revenue generation is and operating efficiency comes from. And that's where revenue management, all these different things, you know, are just, they're different than they used to be. When we first were going around pitching Fifth Wall to large real estate companies, I would ask that same question. Right. Say, who, who does technology here? <laughs> who can I talk to? And in some cases, you'd kind of get a you know, quizzical look of, right. huh? Like, we don't, we don't do technology, we do buildings. Uh, in other cases, you would get, oh, this person does it, and the qualifications were they use Facebook the most. And this is, I'm talking 2016. It wasn't really that long ago. Not that long ago. ago. Right. That is not the case for any REIT anymore. Right. Absolutely. I, I don't know actually the statistic of how many have CTOs, but it's CTOs, chief digital officers, chief innovation officers. It's, uh, it, it's absolutely critical. And the other change is that it used to be that Fifth Wall was the ones driving the or asking the provocative questions of how are you getting access to technology? What are you doing around decarbonization? What has really changed is we don't actually create the demand anymore. Boardrooms are creating the demand public market investors are creating the demand. What local regulators have done, just here in the city of New York with Local Law 97, that's basically a far more provocative and far more prompting than anything Fifth Wall can ever do. That is a huge impetus to adopt tech. And it's also coming from tenants themselves. So the private market tenants, the, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Amazons, they're asking questions of their landlords. And it's not just COVID and smart building related, a lot of it has to do with the fact that if you're Amazon, and let's just say that Amazon is arguably the most important tenant in North America, right? You have to be able to lease space to Amazon to be in the real estate business. They have committed to decarbonizing by 2040. 
And when they commit to decarbonizing, they're committing their entire supply chain, right. scope one, scope two, and scope three. And people always That's forget the, that real estate is the biggest part of most companies' supply chains. In Amazon's case, data centers, warehouses, office buildings. And if you can't lease space to oh, Amazon... we see it as a lender. Aren't they doing the truck the same, EV stations? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, the same is true as a lender. This is going to become a must. Not a, you know, not a maybe, it's a must. Jeff, can I ask a question? I'm curious. Yeah. Um, because you've talked about EV stations, which goes on all asset types, right? We've seen them now in hotels and multifamily and office and everything. Are there other revenue generating technologies like that that really is applicable to all the different property sectors? I can't think of them, so I'm curious. There's a lot, actually. Um, I'll, I'll give just two examples, and, and one of them actually touches on, on EV charging, but data centers. So data centers we think of today as these big, monolithic things that are super hot and need a lot of air conditioning out in the desert somewhere. But actually, they're going to end up being boxes you have in your basement because a lot of the demand for computing power needs to happen close to the edge. So there needs to be computing happening in this building for us to have everyone driving on autonomous cars all around this building. We can't be sending pings out to rural New Jersey right. to yeah. decide whether to turn right or left. We have to do it right here. So data centers are going to move inside assets. That's one. The second one is just the utility business itself. So the ability to have stationary batteries in a building and you can safely assume that anything with a roof is going to have a battery in it. The cost of electricity varies throughout the day. There's intermittency. And so if you can pull energy off the grid overnight, store it at the asset, and sell it to your tenants at a higher cost than you drew it, you're a utility company. Sure. The next level of that is selling it to people that are charging their cars. And the third layer of that, which some cities are starting to institute, is selling it to your neighbor. So you can pull energy off the grid and actually sell it to your neighbor at a lower cost than Con Ed. So real estate owners are going to start to become utility companies in their own right, and that is going to be done at the asset level. But just to, to kind of reflect on the amount of capex that that is going to require, it, you could not overstate. It's, it's absolutely funny, staggering. You know, as you're saying it, I'm thinking to myself, and, and Tom and, and, and Christy probably are as well, and when we raise equity for companies, for the most part, there's a, a use. Right, I, I bought a building, I did this, or whatever it might be. And all of a sudden, it may be, but it's more dribs and drabs. It may be, I'm going to retrofit whatever, and this is the return on that, as opposed to the return on the building, the regular return. And it's both opportunistic and defensive. So like yeah, the, yeah, you know, the, the thing that motivates people to do anything is you know, f fear or greed. Right. We, we've talked a lot about the greed. Oh, there's a great opportunity to become a utility company and sell energy to your tenants or to you know, people charging their cars in your building and make money doing that. Absolutely, real estate owners get that. But the flip side of it is carbon fines and carbon taxes. And if you don't make some of these investments, the city of New York is going to tax you. And pretty much every city in America within 20 years is going to be taxing you. And that is kind of bending the indifference curve of where real estate owners are willing to make these kind of large CapEx investments. But just to put the total number in perspective, the estimated cost to decarbonize the entire real estate sector, commercial and residential, in the United States is $18 trillion. Five of that is homes, 13 of that is commercial. So $13 trillion is going to flow into real estate probably over the next two to three decades. But Which where's is, it going to come from, right? Well, it's, it's I mean, a little it can't daunting. Come from really, read balance sheets. I right. mean, unless it, unless there's a return on it, which there will be, right? right. But are they going to, you know, kind of self finance? Well, and, and even further, I mean, let's face it, we're we're in a world right now where debt availability is challenged, right. right, and likely to be more challenged and more regulated and more everything. Which means, I think, there's more haves and have nots. How do you get to the? You said thirteen. And the, the assumed value for all commercial real estate is, I would, 20 trillion? No, much larger than that in the US. You think? Of residential and commercial, it's much larger than that. Yeah. Okay. But kind of daunting to think about those kinds of Yeah, that kind of number. Numbers. And, and you know, one thing we thought we were innovative on, I don't remember the first year we did one, and Tom, you can relate to this, was green bonds. Yeah. Right? And, and you know, in the debt world, at first it was hard to pitch those. And then people could see, well, there's no downside to, to do one because of the cost was about the same, maybe a little better. We haven't really seen it 
take place in the equity world. Um, in the private world market we have, but in the public markets, there's not really many funds that are out there say, I'm only going to buy companies of X, Y, Z. People just focus on growth returns, whatever they might be. So it's going to be interesting to think through the capital equation, again, unless, unless there's a specific return uh, for it. And um, I guess we're going to find out. Okay. And a lot of the capital will actually come from not REITs balance sheets, to, to your point. There's just there's too much capital that needs right. to flow in. Right. A good example is EV charging, as an example. Like, the large institutional multifamily REITs are willing to make the investment to put EV charging in their assets because it's a very high return on equity for them. And they have big balance sheets. It's honestly better than buying multifamily right, right. buildings. You just get a higher return on it. Right. But small owners, and the bulk of multifamily is small, non-institutional owners, they don't want to put up a dollar. They don't care what the ROE is. They just don't want to put up any money. Right. And so outside capital is now stepping in and providing EV charging, having a perpetual lease to a particular parking space and they giving a rev share. Yeah. It's basically like it's renting the parking spot from the landlord. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it will come in the form of CapEx, but it will also come in the form of rent as well. It's just you kind of have to think creatively to consider yeah. it rent. Yeah. Let, let's switch gears. Um, I see we have eight minutes left. So there's one topic I certainly want to hit, and I want to leave like five minutes for questions. You know, it, it, not a day goes by anymore where um, we're not talking about AI and chat box this and, you know, all those kinds of things. And what, what amazes me in part is that, you know, six months ago we weren't talking about it at all. And each day we seem to be talking about it more. And, and I've had this conversation with you, Robin, about, you know, drafting documents and everything else because it impacts us all. So let's, let's try to get a little bit more specific to real estate. Um, and somebody last night mentioned the fact that every one of their departments that they have, they have to think about how do they use this. Do they use it to enhance productivity? Do they use it to um, have less people? What would they do? And so I'm presuming that you spent a fair amount of time on this topic as well. Let's just try to take two, three minutes to, to kind of frame that and where we think this is going, because it's going a little exponential. People are trying to regulate it. No one knows exactly what to do. Well, maybe I'll, I'll say where I'm optimistic about it and where I'm pessimistic about sure. it. Because I think that maybe is the landscape. Yep. Where I'm very optimistic about it is a lot of the service industries that do highly repetitive work for the real estate industry. Structuring leases is a perfect example. Right. Every lease is kind of a bespoke creation today, uh, and it shouldn't be. And so AI, I don't think, can entirely solve the problem, but it can probably solve, like, 50 to 90 percent of the problem of automating it and then making lawyers just more productive at, at structuring these leases and whether you want to view that as cost savings or you know making your employees sure. more productive i think it's going to cascade to a lot of industries law accounting financials everything that is supporting real estate i think that ai is going to have a massive impact on the side of ai that i'm a little more pessimistic about is around building automation which everyone kind of holds up as like the holy grail, that at some point we're going to be inside buildings that are smarter than we are and doors are going to open and the AC is going to change to exactly the right temperature based on the number of people in it. The challenge is that to leverage artificial intelligence or any kind of intelligence, human intelligence, you need data. And the problem with buildings is most of them don't generate a lot of data, structured right. data right now. Right. And so a huge part of the problem is just structuring and capturing data, which is one of the reasons why Fifth Wall and, and JP Morgan were so interested in a company like SmartRent, because that was really all they were doing. They were trying to automate, but automation wasn't really the core of it. It was just getting data off of thermostats, lights, parking spaces, access control. So we were a long way from capturing the number of data points that we ought to abound buildings. Like my phone right now while I've been sitting here I'm sure has captured more data points about what I'm saying, my sentiment, everything, than this building has, probably about all of us. Yeah. So right. until those two things are the same, there's going to be a, a data gap that is going to be very difficult for real estate to cross. And yeah. so a lot of the intuitions we have about how AI will impact e-commerce probably don't translate to how AI will impact shopping in a mall yeah. for that very reason. Well, you know, one of my fears has always been that... Um, just like when you go on the internet, you presume that whatever you read is accurate, right? And so, hard to know. I mean, a friend of mine was going through an example, and they said, um, you know, who won the election in 2020? It says Donald Trump. 
and it said, what did Joe Biden do in 2020? Joe Biden won the election. And so you, know, you don't know what comes out, and, and, and my fear is that people start to use all these things a bit as a crutch, presuming it's true, and hence you need somebody up above who actually knows what actually happened. Right? So that's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, I know we've got four minutes or so left, and there's probably lots of questions, so I want to pause here. Yes? Where the money's coming from or where it's being, what it's being spent on? Where it's coming from. It's a good question. Um, I don't know the answer. Probably the different technologies, right? The people that want to get the technology out, you know, they're going to have to fund. Right now, we don't have the capital markets infrastructure to fund it. Yeah. And that's actually part of the problem, is that if you have to put that much money into buildings, we don't have that kind of money to put into buildings. And so I think an enormous capital markets ecosystem is going to need to be built up. I think yeah. it's a massive opportunity for any student entrepreneur in the room <laughs> to figure out how do you unlock enormous amounts of capital to provide the capex, really it's the deferred maintenance that these buildings have, to comply, let's say you just took the regulatory side of it, just with local carbon fines and carbon taxes, because an enormous amount is going to flow in. And I think people are going to get a false sense of security based on what the REITs are able to do because they have large balance sheets and they're willing to fund this. And higher versus, quality buildings. And higher quality, more modern, newer buildings and public market investors paying attention to what they're doing versus the long tail of real estate that no one knows how we're gonna get at that $13 trillion. So it is a staggeringly large opportunity, um, I think for anyone in the lending capital market space. Oh, it's hard to see that not being really, really big, and, and it's going to, look, the, the big question is going to be, capital usually flows to what makes money, right? And that's why money flew into venture capital over the last number of years, maybe a little bit less so depending on the topic, and I think that's going to have to show return. It shows return, it'll be there. It doesn't show return, it won't be there. Well, I do think, and I think you referenced, I do think, and you did too, there's a fear component here, yes. and lenders are going to require certain types of investments and that the, the, those types of um, requirements, are, I think, are going to impact our clients. And I'm sure this came up earlier in the day, but scale is going to matter. Uh, for a lot of different reasons, I'm sure people mentioned, but scale is going to matter, matter with respect to t technology and climate. Sure, sure we're here. Sorry, I'm having a little hard time hearing you. Yeah, so I said with the emergence of AI trends and uh, a lot of us not owning physical assets, right? Um, what are the thoughts of, I guess, being replaced before they start, I think is what he's basically saying. <laughs> Becoming obsolete. Well, that's, I'm, I'm not prepared to answer the last part of that. I haven't thought about how and why AI should be regulated, um, either for real estate or not for real estate. What I do think the advent of AI does is it kind of behooves anyone who's going into business right now to think about the fact that humans are really bad at measuring geometric growth. We just are. You have to look no, you don't have to look that far back to see that. COVID, right? We're very bad at measuring exponential growth. And so I think there are certain categories, certain industries, particularly service industries, where the rate of disruption will happen far faster than anything that has happened in human economic history. But I think there are other spaces, and I think the real estate industry itself is an example of that, where I don't see how AI disrupts it. Like we still need a room to host an event like this. And so even though everyone loves to use terms like disrupt, I don't see AI disrupting this room for the same reason that I was always a bit pessimistic that Zoom was gonna disrupt the office industry. I think we still need physical space, three-dimensional space to do civilization and to do the economy. So I guess that's the lens I would use. I think service industries are gonna be very at risk to AI 
but I think certain incumbent industries actually are very durable. Yeah. Um, I'm actually very bullish on the office industry in a way that I think many people in tech are not, because I think we need space to create the economy. Yeah. Can, can we do one more question? I know we're out of time. Yeah, one more question. You looked very enthusiastic. Go ahead. <laughs> why Robin asked Nadim if that's going to, chat GPT is going to choose his next, next investment, so. Yeah, I think investing is, <clears throat> if investing were as simple as just crunching data, I think every investor would already be out of a job because we have an enormous amount of data. So I think it's not just about crunching data, although I do think that's the part that AI Good can on. truly help with, is just aggregating and synthesizing and rendering into a simple, elegant conclusion some bits and pieces that you need to make an investment decision. But just take Blackstone. What makes Blackstone an amazing investor is not just that they have more data. Yeah, maybe it's a little bit that. It's that they have great intuition and they form theses that only humans, I think, can form. Like true, bold, ambitious theses about where the world is going. And so I think we are a long way away from that. So my answer is probably a little bit unsatisfactory in the sense that I think AI will enable humans to have stronger intuitions and perhaps arrive at those intuitions faster or more efficiently. But I think the necessity of having a great intuition about where the world is going is unchanged in an AI world. And so it just changes the rhythm of how we're going to invest. Cool. I want to thank um, our panelists and I want to thank you all for listening. Yeah. Okay.